do you know how to read your tube of paint? In this video, I'm gonna go over the common information that's on an oil paint tube, the uncommon information, and then the stuff that they don't list. So on a tube of paint, the common information that they provide is what I often consider the front of tube information and what is primarily the commercial information. So you're gonna get information about what is the name of the company, what is the name of the color, and you're going to get information about the size of the tube and the series that the tube has. The name of the company, the size of the tube, and oftentimes the name of the color are kind of self-explanatory. They kind of put you in the ballpark of knowing what product you're gonna buy. The series number has to do with the specific pigment or pigments that are in the tube. The higher the series number, either the more rare the pigment is to acquire or the more expensive the pigment is, just generally speaking. The uncommon information is what I often refer to as the back of the tube information. Most of the oil paint companies that you're gonna find are gonna provide you almost all of this information or all of it, but it's uncommon in that there is no consistent way of labeling it, there's no consistent way of explaining it aside from a few key factors. So it just takes a little bit of um, education to know how to read this stuff. The back of the tube information that you're looking for is the pigment numbers, the vehicle, in this case, what kind of oil is being used, the light fastness of the pigments being used, the transparency of the paint, and the ASTM standards that it conforms to. The pigment numbers are the way that we classify all of the known pigments and dyes that we use in the world. They are correlated with a color or hue code and then a number. I'm gonna leave a list of the color codes here so that you can know what I'm talking about. So for example, lead white is the first white pigment, so it's going to be PW1. Things like cadmium red, which is a fairly common red pigment we use, is gonna be PR101, that's pigment red 101. Just because a color is named lead white or cadmium red, for example, does not mean that they use the actual pigment that is associated with that name. It might be that they also use more than one pigment or more than that pigment. Take a look at your tubes and see what you find. The vehicle is the kind of oil that is used to make that paint. I personally look for paints that are either made from linseed oil or walnut oil. The light fastness of a paint has to do with how well that pigment will hold up to fading. The better the light fastness, the more it will hold up. Uh, specifically how well the pigment will hold up to fading. It's on a scale of one to four, with one being the best. I believe the testing standards are light fastness. One shows uh, incredible resistance to fading up to 100 years. And then I think light fastness two is up to 50 years, light fastness three up to 25 years, etc. Something in that ballpark. The main takeaway is light fastness pigment um, Light fast rating one pigments are the best pigments to use. And I personally try to keep my whole palette using just those kinds of pigments. There are certain pigments like alizarin crimson, which have a light fastness of three, which is not great, but they can still be used in ways that sort of prevent them from fading as much as you would expect. You just gotta really know what you're doing. So the safe bet is look for light fastness one, try and stick to those. Transparency uh, is another piece of information that's often on the back of the tubes, and it goes under four classifications, transparent, semi-transparent, semi-opaque, and opaque. I'll leave another key up here so you can see what I'm talking about, but that's just good information to know in terms of whether or not the paint you're buying is more transparent or more, more opaque. Knowing that information will let you know that, for example, Glazing with cadmium red, although is possible, is not going to be nearly as transparent as glazing with something like transparent red iron oxide. By the way, that was a terrible example of not using pigment numbers, so my apologies. The ASTM standards are the regulations that have been put in place by the American Standards for Testing Materials. 
this is actually the only piece of information that is legally required to be on your tube of pain. Nothing else has to actually be written on it. The reason that those are required to be on your tube of pain is because those have to do with uh, identifying harmful pigments, identifying safety precautions, and um, health safety concerns should you ingest or use the material improperly. The final category of information that I m uh, mentioned is before I talk about these unlisted materials on the tube. If you're finding value in this video, I would really appreciate it if you liked it and if you haven't already subscribed to the channel. It helps me provide this information to more people and it makes it easier for me to keep making these videos for you because I'm hoping that this information can just make you a better artist and you don't have to pay art school tuition like I did. It was expensive. The three pieces of unlisted information I will seek out for the paints that I buy are unlisted pigments, unlisted additives, and then even though this is a pigment, specifically whether or not a paint has zinc oxide in it. There are uh, a couple of reasons why there might be unlisted pigments in your paint. There are certain pigments known as extender pigments they either have very poor tinting strength, so they don't affect color change all that much in small quantities. And there are some that have a refractive index really close to linseed oil, so they appear transparent in linseed oil. And they will um, add those to extend the color of the paint a little more. Who'd have thought? Extender pigments. These can be put in in very small amounts to cut down on the amount of pigment that series 47 that you bought that's super expensive, there could be a little bit of extender pigment in there to cut down on that pigment load so that they can extend it out a little bit further. And I know what you're thinking, it's like, this isn't a very big tube of paint, why would they need to put a little bit of extender in it? Well, the thing is, is they might be making 47,000 tubes of this, and that little bit of extender pigment saves a lot of money. So it's not really an inherently bad thing, but it's kind of, you know, it's cutting the goods. Another reason there might be unlisted pigments is that specifically in mineral-based pigments, as you go into the vein of the mine, there's something known as a mineral wobble. So when you tint your color down, um, like a cadmium red, for example, you might tint down part of that mine and it looks a little bit more orange on the half tone. And then you get a little further in, it looks a little bit more violet in the half tone. And there are companies that will add little bits of other pigments to correct that wobble so that when you tint down your paint into a half tone, for example, you get that consistent same half tone that you would always get. It's like buying Coke anywhere in the world. It's going to be the same taste companies will do that. That's not inherently a bad thing either, but it's one of those things that it's like you should be aware of that if you're really interested in wanting a single pigment paint full stop. Additives. There are certain kinds of additives, um, particularly fillers and stabilizers, that get put into oil paint, both student grade and a lot of professional grade, uh, to stabilize the paint and make it an attractive commercial product. The extenders would be things that, that I've mentioned before, some of these extender pigments, particularly chalk, ground glass, calcite, marble dust, things like that. Those are things that could be um, put into the paint to sort of extend the paint out a little bit more. But then there are also things like um, aluminum stearate or wax, uh, wax medium that could be added into a paint. Uh, sometimes companies will add a little bit of varnish into a paint. There's not very many of those companies around, but they exist. Um, and all of those, um, additives, they manipulate the handling properties of the paint in a specific way that the company might be going for, but then they also can stabilize the paint and keep the oil from separating from the pigment. If you've ever opened a tube of paint and there's a little bit of oil sitting on the top of it, that's actually not a bad thing. That means that the paint is pretty simply put together in terms of its recipe, so they're not really fussing with it. They're trying to make you a good product. Um, but that might not be an attractive quality if you have a commercial good sitting on a shelf and it's leaking oil. That commercial good might need to sit on a shelf for a couple of months or a couple of years. So there's things that might need to be done so that that commercial product 
that maybe was made two years ago can sit on your art supply shelf and it still looks fresh. It still operates the way they want it to operate. The final piece of unlisted information, and I think probably the most important piece of unlisted information is whether or not a tube of paint contains zinc oxide, um, PW6, PW4, PW4. Speaking plainly, zinc oxide in your paintings is gonna make them crack quicker and it's gonna make them crack more. Golden has done some recent research on this and they have found that in uh, quantities as small as 3% of the pigment volume containing zinc oxide can drastically embrittle a paint film and oil paint. 3% is an important number to consider because all of these things that I listed before, the additives, the extender pigments, the additional pigments, if they are in quantity smaller than 3% of the pigment volume, they don't have to list them and that's not doing anything wrong. So a tube of paint can have 2.9999% zinc oxide in it. And that company doesn't have to tell you it has zinc oxide, but 3% zinc oxide in a paint film is known to cause problems. Yikes. So we have the front of the tube information we have the back of the tube information, and then we have the unlisted information that some companies don't provide. How do I get that information? I'm gonna give you some advice to empower you and make you a better purchaser of your products. You can buy whatever kind of paint that you wanna buy. Any company, it doesn't matter to me. But when you buy that tube of paint, if there's anything that you wanna know about that tube of paint, you should just contact the company that made that paint. They are not required to tell you any of this information. They're not required to give you proprietary recipes or walk you through the process so you can make their exact tube of paint exactly how they make it. They want to sell it to you and they have that right to do it. If you were to call a company and say, I have this tube of paint in my hand. I purchased it. It is your tube of paint that labeled this. And I want to know if, for example, there is any zinc oxide in this tube of paint in my hand. If they don't give you any information, that should tell you something. So my hope is that by understanding how to read a tube of paint, you can very easily know what is in the stuff that you're using so that you can put it on the canvas the way you want to put it on the canvas. I liken this to cooking. These are your ingredients. Your easel is your chef's table. You should know what your ingredients are so that you know how to use them. I hope this was helpful. If you want to learn how to make paint, just watch this video. If not, just buy smarter. Should be good.